this is Mike Check 95 along with my cohort. Krieger Margin 1. And we are continuing our alien adventure here with the original 1979 Alien directed by Ridley Scott. One of my favorite horror movies of all time. Um, so I guess since my phone is alive and his phone is dead, I have the statistics for the movie here. What I have located on the uh, interwebs is that the budget of this movie in 1979 was $11 million. <laughs> the box office that this film got back was $106.3 million. I'd say that's not bad. Critics and audience scores. Critics scored this a 9.8. <laughs> audience scored this a 9.4. As of, I've seen this film several times, but you know what? We'll go. Oh yes, I was I was starting to fall asleep at that. Um. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, this is just a little info on my watch history with this. Um, this is the second time in my life I've tried to watch this film. The first time I fell asleep during it, and this time I fell asleep during it again. Um, this is a cult classic film that, um, the fact that I said I'd fall asleep during this film, there's probably, if we were a very popular YouTube channel, um, there'd probably be 40 or 50,000 people. I'd like to think thousand. Thousand people, um, down there commenting about how much I'm an asshole and, yeah, and how this movie's the uh, beautiful masterpiece and it's fantastic. I mean, it's mixed about Alien because it's got a good story, a good design, good characters, um, good concepts that they do overall, but it's just so slow in every single movie it makes me hate it. But then, that's what's weird. The very beginning of the film is, okay, well this is cool, and I'm like, uh, middle of the films are always, oh, this is slow, this is awful, and then the end is always really good because they do a really good job. So, I'm always mixed about the films in general. Going into this film specifically, it had a lot less of the slow, it still had it, but it had a lot less of the slowness of the previous couple films we watched. Um, the last review, I wasn't able to be a part of it because I fell asleep during the middle of it, right before it got really good. Um, the, la the one before that, we were preoccupied. But, um, it's time to get crunk. So, I don't know. It's really hard for me to judge this because I want to give it a lower rating. Obviously, the craze gave it a higher rating. It's off to me. Um, the suit, if I remember right, the, the one guy wore the suit the whole time. Like, it wasn't, like, CGI or anything. It was all it was all makeup and effects. And if I, I wish I would have had my phone on so I could look up some of these historical things because I'm pretty sure there's some cool, interesting facts about the actual suit and the design for it. So that looked okay to me. Um, for its time, that did a good job. I think the aspects of... So when the alien was supposed to have survived that explosion, was he hiding away in that in that ventilation system, or was he somehow supposed to have exp survived that explosion and then continued on through space? They probably knew something was up, and it was like, oh shoot, I need to find a, a way to get off the ship, or I'm going to go kaboom, because this, the xenomorphs aren't stupid at all. And I guess, I get, I would say through the air vents or from a distance to where um, Ripley uh, couldn't see it, it got onto the uh, extra ship and just hit in the wires and whatnot. Here's my problem with that. Number one, it's an alien. It doesn't know what any of these systems are or what they do. How could it tell it's an escape chamber whatsoever? It, it, it had to have been, oh, this is an accident, not like, oh, this thing's incredibly intelligent. Um, I haven't seen anything from the first couple movies that these things are supposed to be extremely intelligent. They're supposed to be extremely aggressive. And hunters, not like predators, but like, they're aggressive as fuck, and they're, I feel like most of their strength comes from their biological advantages, not from their actual intelligence. Um, so I don't think that, that, it should have done that. Now, now the alien's armor is extremely strong, so I could see maybe saying, oh, well, it, it exploded the ship, survived the explosion, and it propelled it in the direction of the ship. Um, the way I remembered it is I thought it came from outside, and then she busted the, 
the window and then it blew it away. Um, but that's not what happened. And obviously the thing can breathe in space, so that would have made more sense than it's just randomly in the hatch, like fucked up. So that really, that re I really took away a couple points from that. I really hated the android scene where the android was blown up. Hence, Mike, please show an instant replay of the neck getting it chopped once and exploding everywhere. Like fucking, I felt like Kurt Angle was coming in with a milk truck kind of thing. <laughs> for me to put a rating on this. Um, so it's not, it's not a 10, it's not a 9, it's not an 8. I'd probably put this a 7.8, 7.8, like a high 7. Like this was a pretty good film, especially for its time it was done and in the kind of series it spun from that one thing. The dude who played the android was a good android. He was very believable from the beginning. It was like, okay, well, I know there's an android in every film. And she hasn't, and it clearly hasn't showed anyone. Like, it was clear that he was the android from the beginning. Um, it wasn't a big shock. Unless you didn't think, especially when they're like, oh, I have access to Mother now. It's like, okay, I know exactly what you are. Okay, so I do have some trivia facts, but there is at least probably a 12-page essay worth of trivia and fun facts here, so I'm only going to list off a couple of really short ones and a couple I know off the top of my head. Um, for one, the Xenomorph was all, in fact, a bodysuit. It was in, it was portrayed by an actor. But the funny thing is, though, the actor, I don't remember the guy's name, but I know it was an, an African-American who mm -hmm. accepted the role and whatnot, but after that he was done filming his parts of the movie, he vanished. Hmm. I knew there was something, I remember reading something interesting about Yeah, it. like, I mean... Like, from movies or from life? I, in life. Like, to this day, as far as I know, like, I haven't done too much research into it, but, like, I'm, as far as I know, to this day, nobody knows what happened. You ever seen those child actors who they have that childhood role and then they just don't want to do anything else for us their life because that they don't want that? Like the kid who played Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, but that was a reverse effect. <laughs> <laughs> for as iconic as the Xenomorph is, it only has four minutes of screen time and doesn't make its first appearance until about an hour into the movie. So the screen time could, could be uh, affected because if you notice, th this movie was a lot of the off-screen deaths you don't physically see a lot happen in this entire thing, so I would I would understand that. This was insane for its time. Not a lot of things did this, so that is probably also like, even though this is highly limited to to our standard, that that's what's interesting watching Covenant coming to this, is from our standard, it's very gory. There's a lot of shit happening all over the all over the place, but obviously that's not happening here because this was insane. Just showing a creature like that with the makeup effects that they did and the acid going through the like that was high quality. There was another actor uh, chose for the role of Captain Ballas, we got a beard and everything, but he turned it down. Harrison Ford. Oh, you mean Han Solo? <laughs> <laughs> yes, or Indiana Jones. The original cut of this film ran three hours and twelve minutes, so that's probably the director's cut that I have, which. This was the theatrical cut we watched, because we watched it off the Was that the three-hour one? Uh, the director's cut, that's what I have in the uh, well, case no, here. Well, no, we watched the three-hour We watched one. the theatrical version, so there was some... There, that's why I said, oh, that's interesting, because there were scenes that I saw in the version I saw, because I watched the director's cut instead, and there was a lot that was cut out. It's like watching version. the fucking Hobbit, man. Yeah, because there was, there was a lot of stuff cut out in this version here, so this was probably the theatrical version. And all of the handheld camera work was done by Sir Ridley Scott himself. That is my last one that I could find that was shorter than two sentences. You know, for the longest time, I thought the actress's name was Ridley Scott. That's the director. That's um, Sigourney Weaver. Yes, Sigourney Re Weaver. So when she was... Ridley. W when, n when he made other films, I think we watched a different film that had Ridley Scott in it, or that he made it or something recently, and I said, oh, that's weird that she's directing that. <laughs> all in all, I am going to go out on a limb and 
honestly, to start things off, I'm going to kind of give Krieger some protection. Because I've known this man for a very long time. And I know that he has a very, very, very hard time when it comes to either older movies or slow-paced movies. This film is really good, but it's slow-paced and it's on the older side. So I understand why he tends to go... Also, um, I think I also represent the younger generation of kids that would watch this today. Um, not necessarily that I am one, but people that are younger than us, I think, would have a similar reaction to, oh my god, this is boring, not a whole lot's happening. So this is a very aged film, so you're having two separate things. So for, from people from the camp I think Mike's going to be coming from are like, this is a cult classic, this is amazing, this is a work of art. Um, and then there's going to be new people that are going to say, so I'm about halfway in between. Every time I watch this movie, I just happen to get lost in the story and the acting and the interaction between the characters and the dialogue and just the introduction of the creature and everything and how it's not just all killy killy slashy slashy flashy blood and on screen deaths and over the top bullshit like in the other Friday the 13th films that we've seen or the Resident Evil films that we've seen that's been obnoxious and over the top. This film is pretty down to earth. It's pretty basic with all the stuff and everything, although with the story it's longer, but it does a really good job at telling the story at a decent slow pace, because this is like a slow, like, creepy, like, creeping up horrific movie that's supposed to make you feel uncomfortable, supposed to make your skin crawl and everything. That's the vibe that I was giving in the 1979-1980. Obviously nowadays, it doesn't really do that for me, because for one, it's an older film, but I appreciate what it does, and I love everything about it. And two, I would say the time period, too. Because, like, back then, this was, like, horrific, horrifying. Mm. Like, this was topping, like, movies like Psycho or anything. And this got released around the same time as the original Halloween did. So these two movies were, like, kind of on the same, like, fighting ground when it came to, like, what's the greatest scary movie of the 1970s and whatnot. <laughs> but, flubber. Uh, that's not even a horror movie. Now, I do want to say that the uh, reason why I rated this film a little bit higher is because I think the introduction of the Xenomorph and the way they did it was probably the best that we've seen in the series so far. And I remember through watching it the first time, the pacing of it was excellent. And it, it really, like, that made the face hugger thing scary for me. Because I think I watched the longer version before. And in the longer version, he's the, it doesn't progress as quickly after they get out, right? Like, he, he's around for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I remember watching that, and like, oh, okay, well, he's okay. I guess that thing's just dead. <laughs> and then... Ah! Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm giving them props, but also uh, giving them a ding for this. Um, after the alien first got out, it reminded me of the worm from, uh, from Jason Goes to Hell <laughs> as it scurries away. It was like the exact same animation, like they, they had it on like a stick or something, or like magnets on the bottom of it and just had it. This film for me, um, if I remember right, I did rate Covenant very high because it is probably one of my top ten favorite movies. And quite frankly, I also do put Covenant higher than this movie. I think mainly because of, you get some of, just, for that. of just the time period. <laughs> I, yeah, no, yeah. But this movie to me is still in a very high spot, which I would say this film also, and I know you probably give me a weird look, but you will also understand why I'm saying this. For me, this film, not perfect, but it gets a nine. For me and my standards, because this is where horror movies and horror movie directors should go back and watch films like this and go, oh, so that's how you make a horror movie. You just don't do shitty CGI and go boo 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 for like a, for like an hour long. We're going to end this review because battery that happens all the time with us. So I think we've expressed Whoa. enough. Oh wait, Josh hasn't said anything yet. He's not here. This is my check ninety five along with my uh, space cohort, Krieger Margin one, and we are signing up this review. And remember, in space. No one can hear you scream. And we will see you next time on Alien 2. That's not Alien 2! Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, shopping. <laughs> My god! <laughs>